Welcome. My name is Andy Fields, and I will be the moderator for today's panel. I'm an attorney with the Jeannie Harrison Law Firm and the secretary for the Beverly Hills Bar Association Labor and Employment Law Section. I'm honored to be moderating this great panel, and we have two amazing speakers for you today to discuss the ins and outs of AB5. Our speakers are Nicholas Saris and Eric Kingsley. Both of our speakers will be taking questions at the end of this section, this section, session, excuse me. So if you have questions, please be sure to pop them into the Q&A box so we can get them at the end. Uh, the link to the program materials was emailed to you this morning um, in the uh, reminder email and the MCLE certificates should come within an hour after the seminar is over. So to introduce our speakers today, we have Nick Saris, who graduated from law school in 2005 and has been practicing in the field of employment law for the entirety of his career. For nearly half of his career, Nick was a partner at a national law firm defending corporations in cases ranging from single plaintiff discrimination cases to wage and hour class actions. He also advised U.S. and international insurance carriers in the creation of insurance policies, providing coverage for employment law claims. Since leaving the defense bar, Nick is a partner at JML Law and solely represents employees in both individual and class actions from inception through trial. In addition to his trial practice, Nick also has, also has several published state and federal appellate decisions. Glad you're here, Nick. Uh, Eric Kingsley is a principal in Kingsley & Kingsley, <clears throat> His practice concentrates on wage and hour, class, and PAGA litigation in California. He has been on the cutting edge of numerous legal issues, including being part of a team that took a case to the United States Supreme Court in 2012, and he personally argued a case before the California Supreme Court in Kim versus Reigns in January of 2020 that resulted in a 7-0 opinion in the employee's favor. Aside from his legal work, he has also been act an active member of the California Employment Lawyers Association and on the board of the Consumer Attorneys of California who seek to advocate for legislation on behalf of consumers and employees in Sacramento. Between 2014 and 2016, he served as the chair of the Anti-Defamation League's Pacific Southwest region and stays active with the league in Los Angeles and nationally serving on various committees. He received his BA in history from UCSB in 1983 and remains an avid history buff and political watcher. Glad to have you here, Eric. So Nick will be starting us off with our panel today. Um, and just as another reminder, if you have any questions for our speakers today, please pop them in the Q Q&A box so we can address them at the end. All right, Nick. Thank you, Andy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So we're here today to talk to you about uh, the issue of classification of employees versus independent contractors and the developments that happen through AB5 and Prop 22. But in order to really understand where things are currently, I think it's really important to look at the past because a lot of the previous case law is still applicable today. So let's start at the beginning here, uh, talking about the distinction between an employee and an independent contractor. So the issue actually arose back in the early 1900s uh, for the purpose of really tort law, uh, looking at the principal's liability for the conduct of somebody performing work for them. So common law was used in the past and the issue under the common law test up until an important case, S.G. Borello, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, is that the courts would look to uh, the principal's supervisory power over the individual performing the work. And what came from that is what we call the control test. So 
the courts have said that they would look to the extent to which the employer had a right to control the details of the service and activities of the individual performing the work. Now, it started out under tort law, obviously somebody doing work for you injures another person. That's how it began. Who's responsible for that? Um, as the case law became more defined, the court started opening it up to more employment-related issues. And that's where we get into the seminal case of S.G. Borello. And what that case looked at was the issue of who is an employee for purposes of workers' compensation law. And again, what the court used was the court used the control test. Um, but what they did was they expanded upon a lot of the common law foundations that were interspersed amongst previous case law. So what they did was they defined the control test uh, to determine whether a person rendering services to another is an employee or an excluded independent contractor. What they look at, the most significant consideration was the amount of control exerted. But then what they did was they illuminated several factors that came from various the restatements of agency, actually, to take a look at who is and is not an employee. Okay. So now the SG Borello factors, which are really common law factors that the court articulated, I'll go through them briefly. Um, the first one is whether one's performing services, uh, is in, that person is engaged in a distinct occupation or business. The second thing is the type of occupation, whether it's one that's normally provide, provided by a specialist without supervision. Uh, the third thing they look for is the type of skill that's required. You know, how much, how much skill and education does somebody need to perform this job? Uh, another factor that was looked at is whether or not the principal or the person performing the work is providing the instrumentalities for the work. So for example, in SG Borello, this was focused on uh, individuals who were picking cucumbers. And so they would look to whether or not, you know, who was providing the boxes to pack the cucumbers, who was providing the hose and the shovels, things like that. Courts also look at another important factor is the length of the service. So is it a short defined contractual period? You're gonna work for us for three weeks or is it an indefinite period? Also, they look at the method of payment, whether it's done by time or by job. And most importantly, and this is something that's gonna be explained out further in the subsequent cases in Dynamex um, and Martinez is whether the work is part of the business, whether it's integral to the business. So those were the factors that were defined in SG Borello. And they also looked and kind of, uh, they expanded upon what right to control means. So when they were looking at, okay, what does control mean? They were looking at the person who's performing the work. Do they have the opportunity for a profit or loss depending on how they manage the project? Um, how much is that person who's performing the work? How much did they invest in equipment or materials or tasks? Um, did they hire helpers? Um, and again, they looked also to degree of permanence of the work and always resulting back to whether the job is integral. So that, ca that case came out in uh, 1989, and that was kind of the standard format for how courts would look to whether someone was an employee or an independent contractor using this right to control test. Now, at the same time, there were wage orders that were issued by the DIR, the Department of Industrial Relations. And within the wage orders, there's several wage orders that are specific to different industries. And then there's also a catch-all wage order for anybody not covered by uh, these wage orders. Um, the, 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 excuse me, the case of Martinez versus Combs in 2010 came out. And what happened in Martinez was that rather than an attorney bringing a case and trying to establish that someone was improperly classified as an independent contractor rather than an employee using the common law test. Instead, what they did was they utilized the language that was in the wage orders. And under the wage orders, there's three definitions of whether someone is an employee. And what they looked to was an ABC test, but it was an alternative. It was an or, not an and. And what they looked to was whether the employer exercises control over the wages, hours, or working conditions. Uh, the second thing they looked at was whether uh, the employer suffers or permits the work to be performed. And the third is whether uh, 
the employer is engaging and creating a common law relationship. So it's the backup SG Borrello there as the third factor. And in Martinez, the defendants were saying, no, 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 you have to use the SG Borrello test, not what the wage order is saying. And the court in Martinez said, no, you can use this wage order. Now, what then happened was there was a case called Ayala. And in Ayala, the question was posed as to what test applies? Do we apply the wage order test or do we apply the common law test? And in that case, the court didn't specify which one was the appropriate one to use. What the court was addressing in that was that the plaintiff's lawyer in that case had prosecuted the case under a theory that the employees were, that the individuals were employees under the common law test. And so because they didn't assert that they were an employee under the wage order, the court said, okay, well, you can use either or, but in this case, because you've only used the common law, you're stuck with that. So that gets us to Dynamex. Dynamex is the big case that came out in 2018, which, felt, which created the basis for AB5 or Labor Code 2774. And Dynamex, the issue in Dynamex was whether in a wage and hour class action, when you're alleging whether someone is misclassified, can you use the wage order definition or instead do you have to use the Borello? And the court said that, no, 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 you use the wage order and let's break it down a little more. So the wage order, like I said earlier, has a definition that says to suffer or permit to work. And that is the big thing that's raised in Dynamax is what does that mean to suffer or permit? And that's where we get what we now know and everybody's talking about is the ABC test, the real one. And so there's three factors in this ABC test. The first one is that the worker is free from the control and direction of the hirer in connection with the performance of the work, both under the contract for the performance of the work and actually in fact. So just because the contract says that somebody is an independent contractor, that doesn't necessarily, that's not dispositive of the issue. The issue is we got to look to what is actually happening, right? So we have to look at the nature of the work, the overall arrangement between the parties. Um, do the business needs necessitate control over how the person is performing the tasks? If the, if the hirer is saying you need to do the work in this manner, under this time frame, with this type of a result, well, then the person is not free from control. In principle, when you're hiring an independent contractor, it should be here is the task, go do it as you will. Do it as time, do it, do it however you need, hire as many people as you need. But when you have an employee, when you have a hire, I should say, that's that's specifying all these things um, as to how you should do it, then that's going to be exercising control and direction over the performance. So that's the first step. The second step is that the worker is performing work that's outside the usual course of the hiring entity's business. So for example, I run a law firm. Well, if I bring in someone as an independent contractor to come in on Fridays and cook food for everyone, well, cooking food isn't integral to my business. But if I bring in a paralegal and I try to make them an independent contractor, that could pose difficulties for me because that's integral to the part of my business. And so that's what they're looking to. Are they looking in, this subs in the B portion of the ABC test is looking at whether or not the work that's being performed is part of the business. So if you think back to that SG Borello case with the cucumbers, um, the grower was hiring pickers. And the court was saying, look, this is under the ABC test, they would have said, listen, this is integral to the business of selling cucumbers. Um, this is what you do. You can't just parse out each step of the business and say, no, that's not mine. The third part is uh, C, which is that the worker is customarily engaged in an independently established trade, occupation, or business of the same nature as the work performed for the hiring entity. So if you hire an independent contractor to perform marketing services for you, um, is that person who's performing those services, do they have a marketing company? Um, is that the type of business they do that is not similar? All right. That's what the court is looking to in step C. Now, the burden in the ABC test is on the employer. The employer has to establish that each of these 
elements are met. So the employer is the one who has to show that the worker is free from control, that the worker is doing work outside of uh, the normal course of business of the hirer, and that the person that they've hired has their own type of business is customarily and independently engaged in this type of performance. So when Dynamex came out, everybody sort of guffawed at it and said, oh my gosh, this is a huge change. But in reality, it really wasn't that big of a change. It was really just a refinement of what the industrial wage orders really said. It was just finally the court is stepping away from the common law analysis and being more specific. Now, Dynamex then gets codified in AB5, which is Labor Code Section 2775. And this whole statutory setup under the Labor Code under AB5, really it's, it's a codification of Dynamex. Um, there are some extensions within AB5 uh, that weren't present in Dynamex. The first one is that 2775 expressly conferred on the attorney general or district attorneys the ability to prosecute these claims and to seek injunctive relief against hirers. And that's where you see the case that was included in uh, the materials uh, in Uber, that uh, the state actually went and sought an injunction against this type of activity. The other thing, too, is that the, the issue was that the legislature made clear that the holding is, is to be broadly applied to wage and hour laws. So whereas, say, SG Borello is focused on workers' comp, you know, they're saying, no, 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 this ABC test is going to apply um, broadly, all right, and we're not limiting the holding, okay? So AB5 also, when it was codified, it has numerous exceptions. Um, and many of these exceptions already existed. Uh, so there's always been specific industries that are precluded uh, from having to uh, define certain people as employees. So for example, think of real estate agents. There's specific statutes about real estate agents being independent contractors. Uh, now, within the labor code, when they, caught, when they passed AB5, they also included numerous exceptions to whether or not the ABC test would be applied or whether they would create an, their own test or whether uh, you would revert back to Borello. And some of those, uh, those relationships are business to business, contracting, referral agencies, professional services, uh, contracts for single engagement events, occupations relating to the music or recording industry, construction contracts, data aggregators, various licensed professionals, such as underwriters, doctors, lawyers, security brokers, uh, commercial fishermen, and they actually even have one specific exemption for motor clubs. So for example, AAA hiring tow truck companies to, uh, to provide services. So who had a good lobbyist, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Apparently commercial fishermen as well have a good lobbying organization. <laughs> so, so you have AB5 getting passed, and then what you have is this whole ride sharing issue. And this is where Prop 22 comes into place. So Prop 22, which is codified in the Business and Profession Code 7448 through 7467, this has specific exemptions for the ABC test as it applies to app-based drivers. So it's very specific. It's just app-based drivers. And app-based drivers are defined in the law, either in the public utilities code or specifically within this code, they refer to DNC carriers, TNC carriers, and TCP drivers. But uh, the easiest way to think of it is basically it's either a rideshare driver, Uber, Lyft, or a DoorDash delivery service, so long as those people are using app-based products in order to gain the work. Now, Within the statute, there are exemptions uh, that say that not everybody is necessarily an independent contractor. Um, however, the way these app bases are set up, they tailor this obviously to make sure that it would meet Uber. So for example, you're not an employee um, if the network company does the following, they don't unilaterally prescribe the specific dates, times, or minimum number of hours worked. Um, they don't require you to expect, uh, accept any specific rideshare service or delivery service request as a condition of maintaining your work. So if you turn down a ride, you can't be kicked off. Um, they don't restrict you for, from performing ride-sharing services for other companies. So if you work for Uber or Lyft, then, then you're okay. But if you restrict it, then you're going to run afoul of Prop 22. Um, and 
they don't restrict the drivers from performing other work. So if I wanted to moonlight at night as a Uber driver and they said, sorry, you can't be an employment lawyer, which might be a smart choice on their part, but um, you can't do that. Just so prop, five minutes, okay? Okay, almost finished. So Prop 22, uh, Prop 22, when it was, it was recently passed and there was a challenge raised by Service Employees International Union. They filed a petition to the Supreme Court uh, in order to uh, put a stop to the enforcement of it. And they raised three major issues as to the viability of the statute and the constitutionality of it. Um, first, what they said was that the statute, in essence, violates uh, Article 14, uh, Section 4 of the U.S. Constitution. I'm sorry, the California Constitution. That section provides for the legislature to create a system for workers' compensation laws. They're saying that this that Prop 22 runs afoul of that. Uh, the second thing they said was that they, the way that Prop 22 was defined, the app share companies made a real specific effort to prevent the amendment or alteration of this law. They put in place uh, a super majority requirement, if I remember correctly, it's like seven eighths or something of the legislature needs to uh, pass any amendment. And then they specifically defined what the amendments were. And one of the big ones that they specifically defined was the ability to collectively bargain or organize. And they said, you have to have this super majority. Well, SEIU raised the issue that that is invading on the purview of the legislature's broad authority and also more importantly, the court's authority to define what an amendment is. So when the legislature passed something and they say it's an amendment, well, the court should be able to interpret whether it's actually an amendment or not. Uh, the third issue that SEIU raised was that Prop 22, because it not only just contained the exemption of the ABC test, but it included a host of all other things, including this amendment issue, which was a major issue. It also had to address healthcare issues, um, and what they said was that the prop violated the single subject rule. What it did was it buried all these cryptic amendment provisions within this proposition and didn't substantially address them in the measure. And so what it, they did was they, kept, they put it into language that a voter wouldn't understand. And so they said that this is all unconstitutional. And unfortunately, the California Supreme Court summarily denied the petition on February 3rd. So it looks like Prop 22 is going to go forward, barring you know, lower court decisions, but apparently the Supreme Court is not going to take the issue up. So that basically is uh, kind of the history of the classification of employees versus independent contractors and the state of the law as it stands right now. Thanks so much, Nick. All right, Eric. All right. Um, so, Nick, I want to dovetail from what you your last comment about the um, Supreme Court petition, because I was looking at that over this week, and it's interesting. So uh, the petition was denied, as you indicated, um, but uh, Justices Liu and Quaylar actually both thought that the petition uh, should have been granted. So uh, there's at least two votes on the Supreme Court presently uh, that, that have some interest in, in this subject matter. Furthermore, they, they issued a statement that said that it's denied without prejudice and that the plaintiffs should seek relief in quote, this is a quote, in an appropriate court. So um, clearly the other five decided they didn't want to take it as a direct action, but who knows, perhaps they file in the Superior Court and work their way up through the appellate process. It might end up back there in like four years or something like that. Um, so we'll have to wait and see for a little bit to see how that um, plays itself out. Um, I just wanted to, um, we want to take some time from questions because I see there's a lot of questions coming in already. Um, that to make a distinction, I thought um, Nick, you did a really great summary of the um, the history. But so everybody understands because this gets a little confusing. So Prop 22 uh, only really relates to these um, drivers in a sense, and AB5 applies to a host whole host of other people. So there may be people who are litigating driver cases, and there's specific rules you have to follow there. There's also some additional specific rules on AB5. We'll get to that um, a little bit later. Um, but so um, in order to qualify under Prop 22, though, even if you are a uh, app, what do they, how do they describe it? It's a, um, in, the, in the purpose of Prop 22 is to protect the basic right of Californians to choose to work as independent contractors with ride share and delivery network companies throughout the state. 
So um, unless you're a rideshare or a delivery network company, then you can't utilize Prop 22. So assuming you meet that hurdle, there's a whole host of things that you have to do in order to fall outside of AB5. You have to have a written agreement. You have to have an appeals process. Uh, there has to be an earnings floor. Um, all the gratuities have to go directly to the independent contractor. They can't take any, any portion of the gratuity. Um, there has to be some sort of a healthcare subsidy. Um, and then certain insurance has to be made available. They wanna have, make sure, and this makes sense from a public policy standpoint, you wanna make sure that there's medical um, uh, uh, available for accidents, disability, people are injured in accidents, and then also uh, liability insurance um, if uh, the rideshare um, driver were to injure somebody else. Um, that's why a lot of times you see personal injury lawyers that are looking for rideshare cases because you know if there's a million dollar policy there, it would be an attractive case um, from a personal injury standpoint. Um, you also have to have um, anti-discrimination uh, policies uh, as well as sexual harassment prevention uh, policies. Um, so assuming that you meet all of these standards, so if you were um, attempting to, uh, as a plaintiff, represent one of these folks um, and they didn't have such policies, I have to imagine that Uber and Lyft and DoorDash and all of the big ones are gonna have such policies now rolled out um, if they haven't already. Um, but if it was a smaller company, I know that um, it was in the news recently that some of the supermarkets have been laying off some of their workers to create their own independent contractors to, to do deliveries. So this has is having some secondary effects with other companies other than the main um, rideshare companies are now deciding they can go in that direction and take the benefit of Prop 22. So that's, that's unfortunate. Um, and then the last one, as we sort of talked about a little bit earlier, is the seven eighths um, uh, super majority, which seems sort of why can't you just have it unanimous by both houses of the legislature or make sure that, you know, uh, it, you can only repeal it on a Sunday when the moon is, you know, it, you know, it only half in mean, a half moon, you know, I mean, it, you could create a whole host of just sort of ridiculous requirements. Um, and so I, I think that's an interesting question, how that's going to play out in the courts over the years. Um, the other thing that I found interesting and in sort of doing some research, I was on um, President Biden's um, campaign site. And he actually has some interesting language on there. Um, don't know if it's gonna get through the Congress, but um, he had as part of his labor um, proposals to ensure workers in the gig economy and beyond receive the legal benefits and protections they deserve. Um, and he even goes on to say, states like California have already paved the way by adopting clearer, simpler, and stronger three-prong ABC test to distinguish employees from independent contractors goes on as president Biden will work with Congress to establish a federal standard modeled on the ABC test for all labor employment and tax laws. So um, obviously the filibuster will um, create some impediments to that potentially, but um, you know, keep watch on Washington. Maybe they're gonna have some proposals out there that um, may bring the ABC test nationally, uh, which would then preempt Prop 22 and then um, Uber and Lyft would not have uh, the benefits of, of Prop 10, 22 theoretically, but you know, we don't know where that's going to go. Um, so, uh, Nick, you touched on a little bit on the ABC test. I wanted to talk a little bit more uh, about that because I think that's the key here. So, so um, there's a couple of things to think about. So, so Dynamax um, came down in 2018. There was a recent case that came down um, just this year, um, uh, Vasquez versus Jan Pro Franchising International. Uh, where the Ninth Circuit um, certified a question to the California Supreme Court as to whether or not uh, Dynamex applied retroactively, and they said yes. So uh, presumably, or not presumably, uh, uh, there's nothing left. That they're the final say on this. So um, Dynamex uh, um, applies retroactively, and um, uh, presumably AB5 would, would apply retroactively as well. Um, and so then we have to look at the, at, at the tests and you have that Uber case, it's in the materials. And I think that's gonna be really interesting to, um, to look at. It, it's sort of unfortunate that Uber prevailed in the, in the ballot measure on November 3rd, but the case presents some interesting issues that might not apply to Uber, but they could apply to other companies that, um, that are outside the rideshare field uh, where I think it's, it's determinative. So, um, as Nick indicated, you know, the, the part A is about control. It's really the Borello test to some degree, but in order to satisfy the ABC test, you have to satisfy all prongs of the ABC test from the employer's perspective. And so all the employee really need do 
to satisfy one of the three elements and then the independent contractor status doesn't apply. And so in a sense, that's your goal. And um, I think that in a way, Dynamex was a sea change because I think the Borello test from a class or um, PAGA perspective was very difficult to certify because here you have a six prong multi-factor test that the court has to weigh. Well, you can imagine from a defense lawyer perspective, this creates all kinds of commonality problems um, where they could point to, well, this was different here and this was different over here. And depending how, you know, I mean, the Borello situation was all, you know, um, cucumber workers who were harvesting uh, cucumbers. And so they were all pretty much the same. But you can imagine in a whole host of um, uh, industries where there'd be a large variability in, in, um, in, in the workforce, uh, which would make it difficult. I remember back when, you know, doing some restaurant cases and you would want to represent restaurant workers. And then the defense would point out, well, the cooks do it differently than the bartenders, than the, the servers and the bussers. And so you'd have all these different factual scenarios. And, you know, we would always argue, well, you know, they all didn't get their meal breaks or rest breaks and or all their pay stubs were wrong. So it seems self-evident that commonality applied. But, you know, I understand Creative Defense Council could say, well, these control factors are different between one employee and the other. So I don't think a lot of folks are going to really focus on the A test, but obviously it's something you have in your uh, toolbox uh, if, if in the right case, if, if it made sense to do that. So then the B test, I think, is where the focus is going to be. Um, and the B test, you know, is really just um, does the worker perform work that the employer performs, you know? And um, I think that's going to be interesting because um, I think that you're gonna see some creativity on the other side that's going to be arguing, I mean, that's what Uber did, is that, oh no, no, we're not in the taxi cab business. We're a technology platform that connects drivers with people who need transportation services, you know? And it sounds sort of clever in a way, you know, we're, we're a tech company, we're in Silicon Valley and we're just, uh, you know, a platform. And the court really just said, that's ridiculous. You know, you're, you're a taxi cab company. You are basically finding people who need taxi services and you're finding people who are willing to offer taxi services and you're connecting them. And so you're, um, you're in the same business as they are. Um, you can think back though, to some of the cases that had been litigated over the years, you had the insurance cases, which I think that presents a sort of an interesting um, thought experiment in terms of what we might see in the future in the insurance cases where the adjusters were, were uh, claiming misclassification. This wasn't in the independent contractor misclassification. This had to do with whether they were supposed to be paid overtime. But I think it, it creates an interesting issue is where the, uh, the employer was saying, we're in the business of selling insurance. And um, the, you know, the adjusters were saying, well, no, you're in the business of adjusting claims. And, 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 and the courts were kind of, you know, not sure initially where, where that was, was supposed to go. And you could have a situation where maybe a court says you have a dual function, you know? And so, you know, it, it's interesting to, to think that the Uber is saying, well, yeah, we are a taxi cab company, but we also are a technology platform. I don't think that's enough. So the employers are gonna to have to argue that they are exclusively not in, in the business, but there could be some creative arguments there and there could be fights over what the business is that the employer's in and what the business is potentially that the employees are in. And so that may be the next fight uh, that gets litigated. Um, part C, I, I think is also interesting in the sense that you're gonna have issues there relating to um, whether or not the proper formalities were taken. And so um, you see this in trucking cases um, to some degree where uh, truckers will go get their own business licenses incorporate and all that sort of thing. So that, that sort of becomes a B test. But there could be uh, industries where they don't do that, where uh, employers are sloppy, really, because if you're going to try to get outside the ABC test and you want to ensure that your um, independent contractors are sort of separately organized businesses and, and the like, so that um, you could pass the C test. But in cases where you find that they're not, that then the C test could be could be valuable. I, I can't conceive of a situation where a C test would apply where the B test wouldn't, but I'm, I'm sure I'm just not um, using my imagination enough to figure where that would be. And so once again, uh, it, it, it's, it's something else um, in the toolbox. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do, and we wanna leave some time for questions, is I wanted to talk a little bit about um, 
class versus PAGA. So, um, you know, it, it tends to be that folks want to file class actions and with the um, uh, proliferation of arbitration agreements, that's become more difficult. And um, generally speaking, PAGA claims tend to be um, somewhat smaller than the, um, their class equivalents in part because, you know, a class action with 17200 can go back um, four years, whereas a PAGA claim only goes back a year. Um, but the misclassification is, is a little bit different uh, um, because under Labor Code Section 226.8, which uh, addresses the penalties that are associated with um, misclassification, uh, there's a structure there that creates a, a penalty of 5,000 to up to 15,000. And then if you can show a pattern of practice, it goes from 10,000 to 25,000. It's interesting there that a, a minimum is laid out. And so um, labor code section um, you know, 2699 sort of allows for the court to have um, discretion as it relates to penalties. So assuming that a penalty violation is found, then a court could reduce the penalties. You know, and many courts could say, I, I could reduce this to, you know, 10 cents, you know, one cent, you know, theoretically any amount, um, as long as they use, you know, the standard, um, you know, under, under the statute. Uh, that it would be unfair, arbitrary, and oppressive, or confiscatory. And so if the, uh, if the defendant can show uh, one of those uh, three factors, um, then you know, theoretically the court could reduce the penalty uh, uh, appropriately. However, 226.8 doesn't really um, speak to that because you know, the, sort of the general POG is $100 for each violation, but it doesn't say what the minimum is. However, 226.8 lays out a minimum um, so it's interesting to see whether or not that really means that there's a minimum. Could the court go below the minimum? Arguably, they can't because why would they set up, why would the legislature set up a minimum like that? And so you can imagine in a high turnover independent contractor business, um, you could have a pretty hefty penalty, even, even you know, at the 5,000 number, uh, you know, if you had 100 um, folks, that's that's a half a million dollars right there in, in penalties at the minimum. And then it could go up to the $15,000 level. It could be one and a half million dollars. So that's a valuable amount. The problem is, um, from the employee's perspective, is that 75% of those dollars um, would go to the um, LWDA um, under the terms of the, the PAGA statute, where 75% goes to the LWDA and 25% um, goes to the aggrieved employees. But then there's a second thing to think about uh, from PAGA, which I think is important is because you don't have to certify a class, it's a lo little bit easier case to litigate in that sense. And from a misclassification perspective where you don't have to get into the core claims of you know, uh, my reimbursement or um, overtime meal breaks, th those sort of issues, which can be challenging um, to uh, establish, um, you know, cross class wide, all you have to prove is it's misclassified. So if you can meet the B test, you don't have to certify a class, you go right to trial. I mean, it might even be something you could establish on summary judgment. And then the only issue that's left uh, would be the damages uh, that could be adjudicated at trial. Um, so with that, I think that's a good um, uh, background. We got about 20 minutes left. Maybe we should start taking some questions. Yeah, we have lots of questions here. So the first question is, what about hair salons where hairdressers rent a chair or space, but most of the backup work, the person to wash it, wash the hair, provide the towels and the hair color, other supplies, book appointments and take money is provided by the salon. The contract between the salon and the hairdresser says hairdresser is an independent contractor. Well, that that's one of the hair salons are a specific exemption under AB5. So that's, a, that's an easy enough answer. Hair salons, manicurists, licensed barbers. Uh, what you should really look to is, uh, so all of the exceptions are contained in labor code 2776 through 2784. So there's lots of exceptions and hair salons happen to be one of those. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that, Nick. And the next question is, does the AB ABC test apply to waiting time penalties? I could take that one. Um, I mean, it would. So uh, if, if you're um, misclassified and you're fired, then, and you, you know, you're deemed to be an employee by a court, then you could also seek waiting time penalties. 
And I think to expand on that, just uh, for, for those who might be advising companies, um, but don't necessarily practice in the employment law sphere. You know, a lot of these companies, when I was a defense attorney, a lot of people would come and say, well, you know, we're saving so much money by classifying these people as independent contractors. We don't have to pay workers comp, social security taxes, things like that. I mean, obviously there's a business reason for misclassifying people. Um, it does create unfair competition. And that's kind of where talking about waiting time penalties, the misclassification isn't, doesn't just result in say a willful violation fine. It, it, it triggers a whole host of labor code penalties, including waiting time penalties. Uh, if you misclassify somebody, then the wage statements are going to be inaccurate. So when you're talking to your clients, I mean, it's really important to talk about, listen, let's look at the implications if it turns out this classification is incorrect. And, you know, not to give too much I mean, advice. It's like, it's like deferred maintenance on a house. You're right. It, you know, you don't have to pay the maintenance, but then eventually the roof could cave in. So Exactly, exactly. And you shouldn't make these decisions willy nilly because I can assure you that myself or Eric or any other plaintiff's attorney is going to go after the willful violation. And if you don't have it adequately documented that you actually made a concerted effort to determine whether or not this person is appropriate class, appropriately classified, um, that's something I'm going to attack in a deposition in the trial. Great. Thank you both. So the next question is, what about a gardener who works for an apartment complex for over 10 years, same time and day for the whole period? They have other jobs, but the building managers can, can direct certain tasks. I'm going to object as incomplete hypothetical. <laughs> uh, uh, Eric, you want to jump in or you want me to? I mean, once again, you got to think about the B test here. And I, I guess the employer could make an argument, look, we're not in the business of, you know, mowing lawns or cutting grass. We just want our place maintained. So I guess you'd get out of the B test. Um, I mean, then you go look at the C test is the, is he a separate business, you know? And then I guess then, then, then it comes back to A. So I guess you have to look at control. So assuming that the, um, you know, you know, I, I guess the, the B test seems like a wobbler, you, there could be some play in that. And then the A test, there's there's some play. And then obviously C, it just depends on what the parties did. So it, it seems hard that, that that one could go either way, depending on the facts. And I think the tricky thing in a situation like that is if you're an entity managing multiple properties and maybe you have your property manager at location A performing gardening duties, but at location C, you hire an outside company. You know, well, wait a second. What is it part of your business or not? Um, so it, consistency is going to be extremely important in a situation like that. Great. Thank you, guys. OK, next question. Um, there was a California law that pertains to adjunct professors effective September 2020. How does that work when applied to adjunct professors that may or may not get a course to teach? Hmm. Well, I guess the, the, where I would go with that, I guess, is um, that if you're not performing work, then you could be misclassified, but I'm not sure what your harm would be. Now, I guess you could have some expenses and other things like that. So it could be a 2002 claim, um, but it would, um, I don't know, that, that's a difficult one because if, it doesn't seem like there's potential harm. So could you have a misclassification case in the abstract where you're not actually performing work? Maybe. Okay, um, next question. Uh, what about of counsel relationships with law firms? Oh, that's again, I mean, that's, that's gonna be one of the exceptions is professionals. I mean, obviously you need to make sure you're treating them as an of counsel, uh, you know, don't treat them like your associate, but uh, the of counsel relationship is protected so long as you actually treat the person as of counsel and it's contractually outlined. That's, that's one Borello, of the exceptions. Borello would apply though. So if they're controlled like an employee, um, mm -hmm. then they would have a claim but theoretically. Mm -hmm. but, a, but, but, but the ABC test wouldn't be used. Right. And, yeah, yeah. And, and so, yeah. So the ABC is excluded from that analysis, but if the person is actually enough counsel has their own corporation, you know, is falling into the, all the elements of Borello. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think this is a follow-up question um, with regard to the adjunct professors. It says the adjuncts are employees, but is their hourly wage increased to what is in the law, which if I recall is about 
zero dollars. I'm not sure if that was a typo. Um, if they teach only one class or get a much lower hourly rate, the university pays. Plus, does it all apply? Does it apply to all private or private for profit and nonprofit, or is there an exception, an exemption? I'm not sure I really understand. I know that PAGA usually doesn't apply to, to governmental entities. So that would be challenging to, to bring a PAGA claim against a governmental entity. Um, so um, I'm not sure on the, I mean, I'm not sure about the, if obviously a for-profit institution um, might be a, a different issue. Mm. Okay. Uh, the next question is, what is the impact on the entertainment business like writers and actors? I mean, writers and actors are usually treated as well, a lot of actors create their own independent companies and that's who they hire. Um, writers, I mean, a lot of that is going to be contractually defined from union agreements. Um, so, I mean, that's good. That's going to be a really fact intensive analysis. That's why I think the B test gets really interesting is because yeah. like, the, 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 the studio is going to say, we're in the business of making films and we need to hire actors to make films and you're in the business of acting. So, but are those the same things though? So are you in the same business? Yeah. It's an issue of like disaggregation is a, is the employer just going to disaggregate all of the little functions that go into them building a widget to say, listen, I'm not in the man, I'm not in the business of greasing a bear. You know? Right. We don't, we don't even know how to operate a boom. So we hire a boom operator to do that, you know, so mm -hmm. like, that sort of thing. But once again, what you said, Nick, about well, what if you have uh, your uh, your own sound people and your own, you know, uh, you know, cinematographers, on, you know, in house at the studios, and then you hire them in some other cases, maybe that creates some interesting issues for the courts to look at. Yeah, I mean, at, at least in my personal experience of not doing them on a classified basis, but individually in the entertainment business, I mean, typically speaking, your your gaffers, your people like that, you know, they're all going to be employed by some production company. Uh, that production company is going to run their payroll through. You pick the entity. Cast and crew is a really big one. Um, so, you know, they're they're generally speaking, those types of workers are generally treated as employees by somebody. And then I think you get into the issue of well, if I'm working for production company A and then I'm hired on to do an MGM production can I be found to be an employee of MGM maybe, but I think then the defense would be able to revert back to the business to business contracting, which could be an issue, um, which might get you an exemption from the ABC test. But, you know, I, I get, you know, the truth is, I mean, and I think Eric, you agree with this. There's not a lot of case law that's come out. I mean, this is all very new. Um, I believe somebody asked uh, in one of the questions, sorry, Andy, to jump jump ahead a second, but it's interesting. There's, there's subsection B3 of 2775, which it says, well, if a court doesn't think that ABC applies, then we're going to apply Borella. Well, when does the court have discretion to do that? And there's no case, no appellate case addressing that issue. So, you know, this is going to be ever developing, like Eric was saying, you know, there's a lot of wiggle room on some of these things to really attack it. We're going to have to see how the courts start. To right. And I think at that point, it's interesting what you just said is like in an individual case, sometimes it may be a lot easier because you could get into a lot more facts, whereas mm -hmm. in a class or a POG action, you're going to be a little bit more constrained um, to, in, insofar as that if you're trying to establish commonality across the group. You know, like I, I can see in the entertainment field, like if you wanted to represent a group of people who worked, you know, for production company, that'd be very difficult because if you have sound people and, you know, and, and, and people working cameras and actors and, you know, food service, whatever, you know, there's a lot of different people in the, in the mix. Um, you see that a lot in, in also in I, and not IT, um, in, um, yeah, well, IT and uh, tech and Silicon Valley, when there's just so many different uh, workers who do so many different things that it's hard to um, bring them all together under one umbrella. Okay, great. Um, we have quite a few more questions, so we'll try, try to get to everyone's. Um, what's the state of the labor code section uh, 3351.5C, the provision that converts work made for higher contracts, contractors into employees? I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, I, 
I, I've never had, I've never litigated that issue before either. Okay, sorry guys, we'll, we'll just move on then. Um, has now AB5 been amended to create new exemptions? Where would actors in a small theater fall under AB5? I feel like you guys kind of addressed there this. Was, there was an amendment I thought recently. I don't know who's in there. I haven't studied that, you know. Nick? No, no, I haven't. I haven't. I haven't seen. I haven't looked at the recent amendments. Um, yeah, I think you should just look to what was that? The labor code section twenty. You had twenty seven seventy six through twenty seven eighty four. I mean, if there's going to be an amendment, it's going to be popped in there for any exceptions where they're going to say the ABC test doesn't apply. Okay. So the next question is: I have a case where the person worked for my client as an independent contractor before Dynamex. The company is an investment banking firm and the independent contractor is an M&A professional. I understand that under AB5, because the company has a financial services firm, there is an exception which allows workers to be classified as an independent contractor. I also understand that Dynamex is retroactively applied. Would the independent contractor exemption in AB5 for, finan for a financial firm professionals apply to this worker employed before Dynamex? I think that the legislature drafted AB5 as being like, you know, just reciting existing law. It seems odd if you have the carve out, but. And, and one of the things. Oh, yeah. And one of the things too, and if you look at the statute of AB5 is talking about that, not only is it just a restatement of existing law, but it's also um, previous exceptions that applied, like we said earlier, real estate agents, for example, um, those are still going to be applicable. So you might want to take a look at that to, to determine whether or not um, there are any previous exceptions that might work for you. Okay, we have a few more entertainment directed questions. Uh, the next one is under current law, our direct hire meaning not through loan out companies, motion picture screenwriters and or TV writers who are hired on a teleplay by teleplay basis, employees or, or independent contractors. Many of us have been advising our clients that such writers are employees for tax liability and other purposes, even if most of their work is done at home on their own computers, because we understand, understand uh, Labor Commissioner Rules says that work for hire under U.S. copyright law makes them a writer under and as an employee. I'm not really an entertainment lawyer, so I, I don't know about that. Um, I would say, though, that at least from my perspective, focusing on work done from home, I, I don't think that's really determinative. So be careful about that. Just because someone's working at home doesn't necessarily mean it would change their status. I mean, certainly now under COVID, a you know, large section of sort of the white collar workforce is at home. Um, and, and that doesn't necessarily change, you know, even meal break rules and other things like that. I know at my firm, we've made sure that, you know, our staff who's at home, that they make sure that they clock out for their, their meal breaks and so forth. So, uh, I'm not really answering the question, but I just, as a, as a side note, working from home doesn't give you a, a pass. Okay, great. Next question. Does a writer engage to write a script for a TV series by a TV production company perform work that is outside of the usual course of business of the TV production company? Does AB5, does, I'm sorry, does the B2B exemption apply uh, to that situation? I guess I need more facts on that because for the B2B exemption to apply is the, is the writer, it sounded like it was a direct hire, but are you hiring the entity? Is the writer providing services to other production companies? Um, so, I mean, just to get into whether the B2B is gonna apply, that's, you know, you, you're gonna need more information. I mean, I think whenever you have a situation where an entity is doing a direct hire of an individual, um, if they're hiring John Doe to perform services for them, you know, don't forget under California law, I mean, you're presumed an employee, right? So you, the employer is going to have to hire or employer is going to have to establish these factors. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm advising a, a company, I'm going to say, if you're directly hiring somebody, you know, presume they're an employee and then let's look at how you might be able to articulate that it's not. Whereas if I'm the person being hired, like advising a potential client of mine, um, if I see that they're getting a, a paycheck from company A, then the presumption is that company A is the employer. Jumping ahead to the next question, I think that, that dovetails into what Nick just indicated. 
don't know, Annie, if you want to read the next one about the okay. best arguments. Um, what are the best arguments for workers who want to protect their status as independent contractors because it is a benefit in their profession? And just as a heads up, we have about five minutes left. All right. So I just, I'll make this quick then. So this like lightning round here is that you can't control the B test, but you can control the A and the C test. So I think what's interesting about that is that if you're an independent contractor and you want to be an independent contractor, you can talk to your, to your employer or whatever, whoever's giving you the business as an IC about controlling A and C, but you can't really control B. So if you are in the same business as your employer, there's really nothing you can do. Got it. Okay, we'll jump ahead to the next one. Does Uber still have to satisfy, satisfy the Barolo test post Prop 22? They do. Awesome. Okay, uh, next one. How are employees of loan out companies in the entertainment industry treated? We have another entertainment question. Example one, film director for a motion picture. Example two, motion picture film actor of a loan out company filming a commercial for the U.S. product shoes, for example. I, mean, I, I think, again, you know, it, it's very factually specific. I mean, my inclination would be in a loan out situation would be the argument of the B2B exception would be if I wanted to, to justify the independent contractor position. But, you know, as we've been kind of talking about it, you know, the facts of these are going to be really, the, the determination is really dependent on the facts. It's hard to give a broad statement to uh, whether something is or isn't just based on that. You really need to get into the weeds. Okay. Um, next question. An auto repair facility in the course of an engine rebuild subs out a rebuild of the engine's alternator to an individual who is in the business of alternator repair and performs similar functions for various auto shops around town. Are they an IC? Are they considered an IC? And thank you for the compliment. <laughs> I, I think so. I think if assuming that they, they meet the C test, then then you'd probably be good there. But that's a good example where you want to make sure that this vendor you're using is separately incorporated and all that stuff so that you would have an argument on the C argument. Okay, great. Next question. What about a nonprofit? What about nonprofit organizations that hire instructors to teach dance techniques and an annual meeting where Participants pay for the lesson. Instructors use a technique developed by the nonprofit. Well, that to me would fall within the single event. Um, so if I'm a, I mean, nonprofit or not, that's not going to be dispositive of anything. Um, when I was a defense attorney, I primarily represented nonprofits. And all these laws always applied. Um, but when you're talking about a company putting on an event, a single event, and you bring in somebody for the benefit of your employees, I mean, if we took our entire staff to the beach and I hired somebody to give somebody surfing lessons, um, that person's not going to be my employee. Makes sense. All right. Next question. What about a lawyer who hires a paralegal who has their own business? For example, for doc prep. I'm I mean, always concerned about paralegals. <laughs> it's a B problem, really. I guess that's, that's the question there. You could fix A and C if you need to, but B is going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next question. What about a licensed professional fiduciary who hires another licensed professional fiduciaries? Each fiduciary is named independently by the court and not by the company name. Do the professional fiduciaries get the same rights as, an, as the administrative staff, like paid vacation, for example? Well, you wouldn't get them if you were truly an independent contractor, so... If that's what that's what the question gets at. Okay. Next question: Are persons who are exempt under AB five still st still subject to the common law Borello test? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, let's see. Okay. Next question, um, and we might be only be able to get one more in here after this. Uh, does the AB five test apply to an entity incorporated in California but engaging contractors outside of California? depends on where the work's performed. Um, so California Corporation is employing Bob to do oil drilling in Nevada and all of his work is performed in Nevada. Then the argument is Nevada law applies to the wage and hour issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we are just out of time. So um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, please look out for the Beverly Hills Bar Association Labor and Employment Law Sections PAGA panel uh, that's coming in March. And thank you all for coming. 
And thanks to our panelists. You guys are great. <laughs>